Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Yeshua. I'm the Outreach and Social Media Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. And on behalf of CCSN, I'd just like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Healthy Communication in Cancer. If you're new to one of our webinars, let me just take a moment to give you a brief overview of our organization. The Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, or CCSN, is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about the complexities of our health system, connect with others to plan action and act on those plans to promote better care and healthier survivorship. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, you can visit our website at www.survivornet.ca. You'll find plenty of information there on us, as well as uh, news, events, and other resources that we think you'll find helpful. Uh, just two quick announcements before I hand things over to our presenter. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. In addition, the slides will be available on SlideShare, and links to both of those will be sent uh, to the email you provided and registered. So you can share those resources and go back and watch it again or uh, yeah, share them with others. At the end of this uh, presentation, we will also have a short Q&A session. Um, and uh, however, don't feel the need to wait until the end. Please feel free to type questions into the window at the bottom right of your screen so we can have them queued up. Uh, so now I am pleased to uh, to welcome our presenter for today, Genevieve Stonebridge from Inspire Health in BC. Thank you, Yeshua. Lovely to meet you all and welcome. I am so grateful to be here. Uh, my name is Genevieve Stonebridge and I'm a clinical counselor at Inspire Health, which is supportive cancer care located in British Columbia, but we support patients offering free services across the country. And I'm here today to share with you about healthy communication. But before we get into that, I just really want us to begin in a really intentional way. Gratitude is so important. So gratitude to Yeshua for all his help in helping to create this and uh, to the Canadian um, Cancer Survivor Network for inviting Inspire Health to be here. And I'd like to thank the land that we all are connected on. So we're connecting from coast to coast. I'm out here at the furthest point west in Canada. I live right near a marker of mile zero and who knows who's on this call with us. Maybe there's folks all the way in Newfoundland, the farthest point east. And I think it's really important for us while we meet on a virtual platform to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home and to acknowledge the people and the indigenous people and gratitude for the indigenous people of the land that we are on. So where I live here in Victoria is the lands of the Lekungwin, the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. And I acknowledge and am grateful to live in the territory of the Coast Salish people. And I think it's really important that we honor the original occupants of the land and think about what that means and help to build awareness and respect for indigenous people from coast to coast. So inviting you to take a breath with me and just notice that, maybe feel your feet on the floor. Feel your breath come into your body. And giving thanks as we continue this journey together, knowing the space that we're in really does influence our healthy communication. So I'm gonna give you a rundown of what today is gonna to look like. I wanna share with you just a tiny bit about Inspire Health in case you have never heard of us before. And then it's gonna be all about the what, the why, and the how of healthy communication how it's a really important practice for us while we're going through a cancer diagnosis or supporting someone, because I know some of you may have a diagnosis yourself and some of you may be loving someone with a cancer diagnosis and also beyond for perhaps some of you who are living after active treatment, after the experience of cancer. And then we'll have time, as Yeshua mentioned, uh, for questions. And I just did share with you all, I've been a counselor at Inspire Health for six years and healthy communication comes up every day with people that I'm supporting. So I'm excited to share things with you. And I also share with you that I actually am a cancer survivor myself. And so I come at this approach to healthy communication from a real place of being a patient, of navigating those difficult conversations with those we love, of navigating conversations with healthcare providers, 
So I bring with you both my, bring to you all by professional experience, but also my personal experience as a patient. And I hope that um, that adds a little authenticity to what I'm offering you. So a tiny bit about Inspire Health. We are a not-for-profit, we're located in BC. And as I mentioned, all of our programs and services are free of charge. We have physical locations in BC, in Vancouver, Victoria, where I live, and Kelowna, but we have an amazing online offering, which for any of you who don't live in BC, or maybe live in BC but wouldn't be able to come to one of our physical locations, you absolutely can be supported by us as well. There's no referral required, you just have to go to www.inspirehealth.ca and click the link and you can join us. We've got a team of supportive care physicians, clinical counselors like myself, exercise therapists and registered dietitians, all offering one-on-one -on -one consultations, as well as classes and programs, meditations, um, all kinds of wonderful things, exercise. And uh, perhaps you've heard of us, and if you haven't, come check us out. We'd love to have you join us. Inspire Health really believes in the supportive cancer care model. And so what that means is we wanna meet the person that you are in connection to the diagnosis you have. We know that there are many traditional therapies that are how the cancer diagnosis and the tumor itself are approached. And we know that the person in relationship to that tumor really matters. And we need to support that person at Inspire Health in so many ways. So we really look at the active role of self-management. And we look at how these practices, like you can see on the slide here, really influence overall well-being. We care about who you are first and foremost. And we work in a patient-centered care or family-centered care model. We work together as a team to help support you. And today's presentation really fits into this stress reduction component. And I would say mind body as well. Mindfulness is something I weave into everything I do. And I think mindfulness is essential in healthy communication to help us to reduce stress. It also fits into this place of emotional and spiritual support. And hey, maybe if healthy communication is going well, it might actually also help with sleep and rest. We all know that feeling when we've had a bad night, or pardon me, a bad conversation with someone, and sometimes it's hard to sleep. So maybe healthy, healthy communication can help in all these facets of health. So I just wanted to give you a little tidbit on what Inspire Health is and how we can help support you perhaps even beyond today's webinar. So healthy communication in relationship to reducing stress. We're going to talk about what is healthy communication. Why is this so important in everyday life? Because let's face it, while cancer may be a part of your life now, or maybe it was in the past, you're still a human being and you've been communicating all your life. And so healthy communication in relationship to who you are now and also in the past and hopefully in the future moving forward, how it can be helpful. And I'm going to give you some specific takeaway tools. Mindfulness, importance of listening, knowing boundaries, using I statements, and communicating assertively. It's a lot to pack into a whole juicy hour. So I'm going to be mostly providing you with information. And this is a lecture-based style of webinar. You probably know that. So if you have questions as you go along, just jot them down. And there will be space at the end that we can ask um, you any of those. And I'm also going to invite you to be interactive. I might ask you questions, and you can pop the answers in the chat if you'd like. It's, I always like that interactivity, but no pressure. Um, and just a reminder, this, this may be a taste of some of these pieces. So we're planting seeds today. And at the end, you might be like, whoa, there's lots of things to discuss here. So then come join us at Inspire Health and we continue the conversation. So please be curious and compassionate with yourself. Remembering these are all skills to learn and it really takes a lifetime to practice and learn them. I know that for me. I was lucky to grow up in a family where healthy communication was a huge part of one of our family values. And I'm still working on it. I'm human. I sometimes don't use my I statements properly. My beloved husband will be the first to tell you that. I'm not perfect at this, none of us are, but the best thing we can do is to show up and be willing to be kind to ourselves and each other. So, what is communication? In a sense, right, in the very base level definition, it's imparting or exchanging information, usually between two people. Of course, we also communicate with our animals and the world around us in other ways. We often use our voices. Some of us don't have that ability. So we might be using our physical gestures. We might be using our eyes in some cultural contexts. We might be using our tone of voice to get a message across. 
we can use so many things actually beyond our words to communicate. And I'm curious to know, this is gonna be my attempt at trying to see if any of you might like to engage of what is communication to you? And just sort of, you can pop in the chat perhaps, what, is, what makes up healthy communication? Like what would you say are some of the tools for healthy communication? I'll see if I can get you using the chat. And if not, I'll just keep going, but I'm gonna put it up to you. So if you were to put something in the chat, you could say, what was a tool for healthy communication for you? An example might be listening. Anybody? I hope that I'm seeing, Yeshua, you tell me. I'm looking at the chat, I don't see anything, so. I don't see anything coming through the chat. Okay. I also just want to apologize to anybody who's having audio issues. I We are working on trying to get that for you. Um, as well, just a reminder, this is being recorded and you'll be able to watch it tomorrow as well as the slides that will be available to you. All right, perfect. Thanks for letting me know that. Is there anything I can do to help on that, Yeshua, around the audio? Um, no, I, people are just having trouble hearing on their end. Okay. But I can Okay, so here Yeshua and I are actually modeling healthy communication, right? It begins and obviously on the technology front, communication can be really hard um, and it takes a lot of patience. So some tools for healthy communication, courage, compassion, and curiosity. Taking a breath, if we notice ourselves feeling frustrated being kind to ourselves and one another. Sometimes these difficult conversations take a lot of courage for us to have. Listening, so essential, how we listen, how we can listen, right? Sometimes if we can't hear properly, it can be really hard to communicate healthily. And there's not only the physical barriers sometimes with listening, that can be the emotional, mental barriers, right? We often are trying to communicate something from our own place of knowing, our own stories, my experience of being a Genevieve to all of you. And you're also listening with your stories, your experience of being the person you are. Listening is also so complex. We communicate, as I said, with our body language, right? The difference when someone's like, yeah, I'm listening to you or rolling their eyes. Eye language in some cultures, right, is so important is how we connect, right? And it's different depending upon who we are and how we've been brought up. But these curiosities of our communication go so far beyond the words that we use. Some of you may have heard that research study. It's particularly based upon high conflict situations where when it sort of gets distilled down of how much is the message that we're hearing based upon the words we're using and it's like 10 percent and the rest 90 percent is the tone of voice and our body language so it says a lot so we need to be intentional about how we communicate and our tone of voice mindfulness with our words and this is just planting a few seeds here these are some things i've learned along the way to throw out that word should as much as you can there's a lot of shoulds on us in the world as humans in general, and particularly in a cancer experience. Oh, you should be more positive. I should eat more kale. I should exercise more. I should, I should, I should. And it ends up sounding like we're shooting on ourselves. Yes, it sounds like what it's supposed to be. A psychologist, Albert Ellis, coined that term. Stop shooting on yourselves. Instead, it can be I could. I could exercise more. I want to eat more kale. I will, I won't, but let's stop with the should. It often feels like a big finger pointing at us. I should, like how I am right now is not enough. So I could, I can, I will, I won't. Let's change those shoulds. And versus but. The first time I heard this, it was like revolutionary to me when someone pointed this out, that in sentences, and again, if you're an English major, or, or grammar is your like special thing, you're gonna be like, what, we can't throw out buts. And it can be helpful, particularly in communication and around sticky subjects. So I'll give you an example. Maybe we're giving feedback to one of our healthcare providers. You know, I really appreciate the time you've taken with me today, but you were late. What do we hear? I mean, you heard my tone of voice, right? I really appreciate the time that you've taken with me today and you were late, it caused a bit of stress, huh. right? We can do both and with and. It's like both can exist together. As soon as we put a but in there, it negates the positive part of that message. I'm sure all of you have gotten those kind of 
compliments. You know, I really love you, but you haven't unloaded the dishwasher in forever. Hmm. I really love you. And can you unload the dishwasher, please? We can do both of these things and but negates the first part of the sentence. So it's one to think about getting rid of those buts. Yeah, but, and, right? Sometimes versus always and never. Those absolute language can often pigeonhole us and others. Oh, you never do this. You always do that. I'm always this, I'm always that. How about sometimes? How about often? It's very rare that any of us are always or never one way or the other. So mindful attention to the words we use, including I statements. So there's I language, how we look to each other. There's also I statements, personal responsibility. And really, honestly, if the only thing you take for this whole entire uh, webinar is about I language, I would be thrilled. And it's about personal empowerment. And I'm gonna talk about it on the next slide here. But this basic idea is speaking from the place of I. Instead of in a you, you know, you really need to do something. It's from a place of, I would really appreciate if, but I'll, I'll talk more about that next in the next slide. Mindfulness of timing and environment. And most of you will know this, right? I'm sure all of you can think of a time during your diagnosis where you've had a conversation and it wasn't the right timing or it wasn't a safe environment. We know how sensitive we need to be, especially when we're sick, to where and how these conversations are being had, with who, and at what time. Before bed, not often the best time to bring up big subject matter. We have a rule in our house of the conversations that are had before bed because we notice, right? Some conversations are more activating, whether they're about work or they're about money or they're about health. We might not wanna do those right before bed. We might wanna carve out special time and safer environments. And mindfulness, you might have seen that from my bio, mindfulness is something that's super important to me. I'm a qualified MBSR teacher in training and it's been revolutionary for me as a human being. Uh, with a body that um, wrestles with illness from time to time, I am cancer free in this moment, very grateful, um, but mindfulness has been the biggest lifesaver to me. So I try and uh, weave it into everything I do, including healthy communication. So I'll, I'll define that shortly here about how we can use it in communication. So one of the things to consider here and some of the research around um, communication needs of cancer patients is knowing that all of this, including listening and talking and being respectful in decision making is so important when managing the tension that naturally exists when cancer is part of your life. It helps us to regulate. It doesn't make it all better, but it helps us. So I wanna talk about how eye language can help us. So using an I statement, some of you may be familiar with this term, but in essence, it's just as I started saying before, it's speaking from your own personal experience. So what that might look like is stating how you feel. I feel sad. So I feel sad. I stated the emotion, not I feel like or feel as though I feel an emotion. Because I'm sick and I'm worried I'm burdening you. So we've shared how we feel and why we feel what we feel. Just notice that, it's tender, right? I'm sure everybody, even the people who are support people have felt this at time to time. We're often always worried that we're being a burden to those we love when we need help. This is very different than you make me feel like I am a burden. Feels different, right? So this is like, again, if the only thing you take away is to get out of these places of you make me feel. We do it when we're mad, when we're stressed. You make me, you made me feel unimportant. You made me feel stressed. You made you. We give all our power away when we say you. And we can say and honor the same emotion, but label the emotion and come from our place of our own inner knowingness. I feel scared. I feel stressed when I don't know what's happening versus you make me feel stressed when you don't tell me anything. You, it feels, you know, defensive. Anybody uses a you statement on me, I feel defensive. But if they just tell me how they feel, ah, drop the defenses, sink, sink in with compassion. And this really, you know, is how we can take personal responsibility. And I, I'm telling you, this is the best place to come from. 
especially when we're sick, is how do we take care of ourselves and learn to find our own experience and express and share and communicate that with those we love. And this last little note here is remembering, I feel that you are a jerk is not an I feel statement. <laughs> I feel frustrated because you didn't blah, blah, blah. Right? That's very different than you, I feel you are a jerk. There's no information there. It's a name calling for one. I'm gonna throw that idea out. And it's a you statement, right? I feel that you are, I feel as though, I feel like these are not I feel statements, they're thoughts. As much as you can get to that emotional piece. So notice if there's any questions you have there, I'm gonna weave it back in at the end when we talk about assertive communication. And remember, this is a skill to learn. It takes time, but it's powerful. And I've seen it with myself and the people I love in my life, the people I work with, and I've also seen it in the patients that I support um, and the way it can really change things if we just use an I statement. So why the heck are we talking about this? I feel like I may have built the argument for you enough, but it really is hugely about stress reduction. And you know what I've noticed over my years, I've worked in cancer care for about 10 years, and what I've noticed over the years is a common complaint from folks is either feeling a disconnect from their people and feeling like, where did everybody go? And feeling about a bit abandoned. Like, you know, they just said, let me know if you can help, if I can help, and then they disappeared, right? So some people feel abandoned. And then I hear from other folks where they feel kind of cloistered and, and overpowered. Like they've got that one family member who's like, you need to do this, that, the other, you shouldn't be doing this. And there's this feeling of overbearing, domineering pushiness. So on the spectrum we sit, some people feel abandoned, some people feel overly controlled. How do we find the place in the middle? And that's what this workshop really is all about, is finding our place in the middle so that we can reduce stress and figure out what we need to let those that we want in, in, and set boundaries with those that we need to not be as close to us. And we're talking about boundaries just shortly here, but really it's about reducing stress. And that research study that I mentioned before um, about the communication needs of cancer patients, and it was really a literature review of a lot of different research studies around healthy communication and cancer patients really pointed to this, how open constructive communication can reduce the stress of the caregiver. So if any of you are caregivers or support people, that's you. And it actually also can improve the physical and mental health of patients and caregivers alike. So why not give it a try? And we also know that it can actually create connection. And the same literature review pointed how the fact that open and constructive communication actually promotes intimacy between the cancer patients and the caregivers, or I call them support people, and that this really can reduce the tension and increase coping mechanism. And I've, I've seen this time and time again. It's often a bit of awkwardness at first. That's why we need that courage and that compassion. I know that in my own life, sometimes having those hard conversations with the people I trust, it's like, oh, at first it's uncomfortable. And then what relief that I know I can be honest and we can find our way through it together. So how does mindfulness relate to all of this? Well, for example, I'm giving this presentation, I'm pretty excited about it, and it's helpful for me to be mindful of my breath and my body while I'm doing it, just for any of you when you go to navigate a conversation. We know that when we're in fight or flight mode, that's in our protective mechanism mode, which is often up when we're stressed, we are often not regulating our bodies very well, and mindfulness can help us do that. Really interesting um, awareness about our brains. When we're really angry, we often, or stressed, we often are operating from that old limbic set as part of the brain. You've probably heard of it spoken to. And when we engage in some mindfulness practices, even the stating of I feel angry helps to bring on this part of our brain that is more helpful for connecting, relating, communicating. And so I wanna offer you a mindfulness technique. It's real simple, you may have seen it before. I know mindfulness is a bit of a buzzword. If you wanna learn more about it, come join us at Inspire Health. It's really helpful, I find, but it's the stop practice. So we're gonna do it together. So inviting you right here, right now. If you're standing or seated, just feel your feet on the ground. Maybe even look away from the screen. That's so important. When we spend a lot of time on the screen, we need to give our, our eyes, our brains a little bit of a break. So I always like to look out my window. 
So that's about stopping. So this is what we're doing. So we're stopping and we're taking a breath. And then we're observing. And observing means, whew, what's happening? How am I doing physically, mentally, emotionally maybe? What am I noticing? And we might even ask ourselves, what do I need right now? And it might be one more breath. That's the O to observe internally so that we can P, proceed mindfully. You can bring your eyes back to the screen if you haven't done that. So stopping, taking a breath, observing, proceeding mindfully. So how I am inviting this practice in is you can stop at any time. In, you know, before you eat, it's helpful to stop. It's helpful at the beginning of the day to stop and pause before you brush your teeth, right? You can stop at all times, but you can stop in healthy communication too. You can take a stop break before you go into an important conversation with your doctor. You can stop when you get an aggravating text on your phone and you feel stressed about how to respond. Stop, put your phone down, take a breath, observe what's happening inside of me. Ooh, I feel stressed, I feel angry, I feel excited. So we can proceed mindfully. And this is helping us to respond instead of react. When we are stressed, we have to work on this so hard. So much empathy. If any of you are going, map, I can't do that. My brain's too busy. I can't settle. I promise you, you can. It just takes practice, practice, and then a little more practice. But we can learn to try and regulate our bodies. So then we can more mindfully connect and taste our words before we spit them out. Has anybody ever said something that they regret? when they're in a heightened place. I have plenty of times. And I've also caught myself and it's like uh, biting my tongue, mindfully noticing like, no, Genevieve, you're mad, but that's not gonna help. Take a breath. And honestly, sometimes, and because I'm funny and weird, I like to do experiments. I sometimes notice when I get activated or I'm angry, I might even have a timer and notice how long does it take my nervous system to settle? so that I feel more logical, rational, that initially I might've been like, no, I can't do that, or blah, 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 or how dare they? And if I take a breath and a stop break, sometimes you have to take them for longer than one minute or one breath. Sometimes it's 20 minutes, sometimes it's a day. I have noticed, right, that there's always a shift with a bit of space. So we taste our words before we spit them out. So this is where mindfulness comes into it. So inviting you to put that one in your pocket, stop before you go into big conversations. Stop if you notice yourself reacting to something. Stop, you can stop to savor lovely moments as well. If you're having a tender moment, and certainly I know that cancer brings up lots of tender moments and prioritizing what really matters, we can stop and savor a lovely moment as well and take a breath and appreciate a loved one and just look at them and go, oh, thank you, that also, is how mindfulness can help in healthy communication. And it can really help with listening. It's hard to listen to each other. And you might be thinking, hey, I'm the patient, I'm the one who needs to be listened to. Absolutely, 100%. And sometimes the best way we can promote good listening in others is to model it ourselves. And I love this little doodle. Um, this is from Dharma Comics. I love the sound of you listening. Anybody know what it feels like to really be listened to? If someone just listens with embodied practice, you know, that open body language, maybe eye contact, it feels good. So this is just planting an awareness that listening is so important and it also takes practice because we often listen to reply. We often listen with our own story instead of really trying to understand one another and just hear the words that are coming out. So here's a few tips on listening. And again, knowing it's a lifelong practice and mindfulness is so helpful for that. If you find yourself wanting to interrupt or say, yeah, but, or take a breath, be present and pay attention. So a lot of words on this slide. I realized I should have had them come in one at a time, but here we go. So to be present, right? Be mindful, pay attention, body language and eye contact. Minimal encouragers are helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Yep reflective listening. I, I hear you saying, sounds like, and you can really clarify, what did you mean when you said that? 
is that what you meant? So to be curious and clarify, so helpful instead of judgmental. And really, period, the biggest thing I can offer when you're wanting to listen, whether you're the patient or the support person or your medical team, we do not have to be perfect. Let's just be present. Don't be perfect, just be present. And please, please, please try not to fix. A lot of us feel that way, especially if we've been sick or we are sick, well, there's something broken in us. No, but there is something that needs help, but you're not broken. And the same thing for support people. All of us often feel that way. There's nothing to fix here. It often just needs to be held, listened to, and supported. And that's how healing happens. Sometimes all people really need is a good listening, right? And we can offer that to one another. So remembering the power of listening. So we can listen to ourselves. And that's what boundaries are all about. So boundaries, in essence, are where I end and you begin. And listening, you know, this concept that I'm moving from involves boundaries, right? If I'm interrupting a lot, I'm not listening. If I have split attention, I'm, you know, maybe honoring my own boundaries, but not yours. And listening to our boundaries internally is so important as cancer patients people who've been impacted by cancer, human beings in general, and we're not taught about boundaries a lot. So this is a little introduction to boundaries. So you see this picture here, and uh, this is down the road from my house at a place called Dallas Road. And these are, you know, an example of physical boundaries. There's that lovely fence there and those two folks, and the boundary is the fence to the edge of the cliff. You can see they're close to each other. So there's a physical, boundaries with each other as human beings and the physical boundaries of space. There's material boundaries, like that umbrella, right? We share with some people and don't with others. There's the emotional boundaries, how much we share about our feelings. We have spiritual boundaries. There's many different facets and com complexities to boundaries, but starting to know and some people say to me, you know, Jennifer, I don't have any boundaries. Well, that's not true. Generally, we all have some sense of boundaries, but they really exist on this spectrum. And we're figuring out, you know, day by day, moment by moment, interaction by interaction, where our boundaries are, where I end and you begin. And assertive communication, which is going to come after for this part here on boundaries, really helps us to set our boundaries and know them. And it's a lifelong practice. So a reminder that boundaries are not just about saying no. Sometimes people say that to me, like, I'm really good at boundaries. I say no all the time. Remember, they're semi-permeable. It's as much about keeping things out as it is about letting things in. So they exist on a spectrum. Too rigid and our boundaries become walls. Nope, 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 nope. Too flexible, if we were in person, this is generally the part in my presentation where I lie on the ground. <laughs> Too flexible and we become doormats. And I'm sure each one of you have had experiences, I know I have, of being too rigid at times and too flexible at times. And we all generally exist somewhere on this continuum of boundaries of feeling too rigid or doormatish. The wall or the doormat. And we want to find that place in the middle. And what that takes is knowing what are my boundaries. And it's a reminder too, I've, I've seen this so often, like when people want to be good patients and people pleasers. And so they just say yes to everybody. That's in the doormat area, right? That's just yes, yes, yes to everybody. And then I've seen on the other end where it's like, nope, I don't need any help. No, I, I don't want to burden anyone. Nope, 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 nope. And then the world becomes very small because we're pack animals. We need each other to survive, to heal, to grow. And so it's finding our place in the middle and it's not the same for all of us. Some of us want a circle of many folks surrounding us and supporting us. Some of us have a chosen few. There's no good and bad or right or wrong. It's just bringing awareness to the spectrum of boundaries within you and starting to get clear or clearer about what is your yes and what is your no. And this is so important because boundaries help us know where we each end and begin. And I love this quote by Brene Brown, who has lots of great literature about boundary setting. Oh, and just so you know too, I should have said this at the beginning, I've made you a handout. 
So if you're furiously scribbling notes down, awesome. All of us learn in different ways, but also know I'm going to send you um, a handout with different quotes um, and the books and things that I'm citing and, re and the re research studies. So that will help support your continued practice. So I love Brene Brown and what she has to say about boundaries. She's taught me a lot about boundaries. She says that daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing another. I'm gonna say it again. Daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing another. So an awareness here. A lot of us struggle with boundary setting because we're worried about that discomfort of disappointing someone of saying no to someone and maybe hurting their feelings and yes to someone else and what is someone else going to think we do a lot of wondering and Brene also has a great quote that says choosing discomfort over resentment and just think about that choosing discomfort over resentment oftentimes setting our boundaries involves that there's going to be discomfort when we say no or yes and that's a given setting boundaries isn't easy but the long-term gains are powerful. And Dr. Gabor Mate, a physician really interested in um, a lot of mental health, talks about it when the body says no, and it's this awareness of the psycho neuroimmunology, how our wellness in our mind impacts the wellness in our body. And he says that it is better and healthier for our bodies to have short-term guilt of saying no or not doing something that's better for us than the long-term resentment of saying yes when we wanted to say no. Just ponder here, have you ever said yes when you wanted to say no? Or loaned somebody something when you wanted to say no? Or shared something with someone and then went, oof, I wish I hadn't shared that with them because then they went and shared it with somebody else. We can bring up these feelings of resentment. Sometimes it's towards ourselves, sometimes it's towards them. It's really important for us to start to distinguish where do we want to say yes and where do we want to say no and can we be with the discomfort so just pondering and finding the way to our voices and learning to express them assertively again why why is this important it's so important during cancer diagnosis and it really again reduces stress and actually increases connection and I love this little boundary uh, comic here um, from Dharma comics it says little step person says here my boundaries are important dear self please respect them and then a stick person to another stick person this is my boundary and the other person puts a rose at the boundary line okay and then there's a jumping into each other's arms because there is a respecting ah you all stay on this side you stay on that side a respecting and noticing so it's really important because actually it can help increase connection. You probably know those people in your life who you're never really sure, is it a yes or is it a no? Are they just being nice? Why do they always say no? And when we can get really honest, I have one really great friend um, who, I, who I just know, she will let me know if she's not able to connect and she will let me know when she really wants to. And it feels great when we connect. I know that she genuinely wants to and I know and she knows that I'm safe that she can say, nope, I don't have the energy. And I love that, I think it's so important. And it takes time. And I wanna give some really specific examples of boundary setting in a cancer experience. And very grateful um, to uh, Cancer Today magazine where I learned a lot about this um, and boundaries. So point number one is really being mindful of who and how much you share about your diagnosis. We're all different, so there's no sort of set protocol or amount that we're supposed to share. and it really is up to you. How much do you want to share with work colleagues, friends, casual friends, distant family members? You do not owe that information actually to anybody. Do you really can choose how much you share and in what way? And you may actually even sometimes need to let people know how much you'd like them to share. And that is a boundary, how much we share and who we share it with. And a great example a patient shared with me was actually at the beginning of their diagnosis when they weren't sure what was unfolding. You know, they knew they knew they were sick, they knew they had a diagnosis, but they didn't know what the treatment was. They didn't know how long it would take. They didn't know how serious it was, and it was all quite up in limbo. And they kept that information really close, 
just to one or two close people in their support circle. And once more information was revealed, then they let more people in. And what that allowed was an awareness of, okay, this is what's happening as opposed to everybody jumping to conclusions and oh no, and what does that mean? And then that allowed the patient actually to dictate a bit of what the narrative was about that specific diagnosis. So it's just one example, right? We can share, decide and choose how much we share who and when, the timing as well. It's totally okay, I'd rather not talk about this. And on the same side, it's totally okay to say, we never talk about my cancer, I'd like to. Because some people think, oh, don't talk about it. And other people are like, tell me more, tell me more. The more we practice this, the easier it becomes. And so you might even want to write that line down. I'd rather not say more about this. I'd really like to talk about this more. It's boundary setting, right? Remembering letting in and keeping out. It's a choice. This ties into point number one, being mindful about telling people sensitive information. So remembering that there may be details about your treatment or about your diagnosis that you don't want them to share. Patients have talked to me about needing to be really strict with some family members about their use of social media. There can be a, a want and a desire for connection in that way, which is fine, right? As long as it's directed by the patient, right? In, in their choice of how much their story is shared in that way. So sometimes we have to be really um, choiceful in the words and asking our family members or friends, you know, I would prefer if you didn't share it in that way in social media, or maybe you want to, you know, I, I mean, there's lots of beautiful ways that social media can support. And there are also some other ways where boundaries get crossed left, right and center with social media. So boundaries with social media is really important as well. Telling people when a conversation becomes too stressful, you can simply say, this is not helpful. I love this one. I am still surprised to this day how I had cancer now 20 years ago and I, I've dealt with health things you know, in, in these 20 years, but I still am so flabbergasted when people will tell me things like, oh, I knew somebody who had that cancer and died. Not helpful. So we can sometimes cut them off at the pass, right? Sometimes people, and I really believe it comes, to, you know, when I'm thinking of compassion, generally this comes from a way, you know, a place of wanting to connect. So we might hear them start going into, oh, you know, my aunt had a similar cancer and, and you might just stop them and go, you know what? I'm just trying to be really careful about what, how much information I take in. And if this story doesn't end well, I probably don't want to hear it or you might even just not wanna hear it, right? There's a certain point where we hear so many stories about other cancer patients, we might not want to hear more. We might just say this is not helpful. And again, we can also say it is helpful, right? So that's an individual choice. It's not one or the other. It's all of our own individual preferences. And that's why boundaries are so contextual and individual. Um, preserving and prioritizing your energy, really simply, exactly as it states you need to be careful of your energy right how where and with who do you want to spend your time sharing your expectations for social distancing before visits so this is a big one it's up for many people right now and so just knowing that that actually is a boundary that all of us are navigating in the world right now is figuring out what do we all feel comfortable with with our different belief systems and our different immune systems and bodies and that's all I'm going to say about that. But just so you know, that's actually a boundary. And this actually includes with our medical professionals. So sharing personal preferences and values with your healthcare team. So sometimes we might actually have to let our team know that, you know what, the more information I have, the better. We might be that kind of patient. And with others, like, you know what, the less information, you know, just give me the bare bones. What do I need to know? That's good enough for me. That's a boundary. How much information do we want? So we can share how we actually want to um, engage with our uh, healthcare team. So these are a bunch of different ways. I know it's big. So let's just take a breath together. Mindfulness, right? And knowing and remembering. Boundary setting is a skill to learn, to practice. And you are allowed to say no. No is a complete sentence. And just remember things on the spectrum. And also remembering it takes time. So you might say, um, you know, so-and-so, I'd prefer if you didn't. 
post about that such and such thing and then yeah they say sure and then they take a picture of you one day and then they post about that and they're like oh i'm so proud of such and such a person and it comes from this beautiful place but we actually might need to state the boundary again commit and persevere and assert our right again so this little piece here is actually just to let you know it's often not as simple as saying it once sometimes we have to say it twice and that's that continual committing and persevering and asserting our right and it takes time and there's lots of contextual pieces in this but again just planting a seed today and i want to move you to our last skill and that is assertive communication and boundary setting really is at the heart of it so assertive communication essentially and why it's such a helpful component of healthy communication is it really is in conflict or difficulty is i'm okay and you're okay it's taking the stance that i have needs and you have needs i have opinions and you have opinions and trying to acknowledge that we both have something to offer and it's really not so much as win-win but more i'm okay and you're okay and trying to find the place in the middle this is very different than passive aggressive aggressive and passive communication and i'll give you a little tiny example here so let's just say I mean, here's a simple example, right? That actually has nothing to do with cancer, but we all probably at times have been asked to help people, right? So let's say moving, someone asked you to help them move. If I was to, so Len, let's say I don't actually want to move, help them move, okay? I actually have a friend who's moving soon. So let's, let's play this one out. So friend says, hey, Jen, can you help us move? If I was being aggressive in response, it would be like, how, dare you do you know how hard i'm working and how tired i am what kind of friend would ask me that right now i'm very angry right i'm okay you're not how dare you right aggressive if i'm being passive aggressive it's essentially um subtly letting them know that it's a no and that i'm okay and you're not okay but it's all very passive passive aggressive which i find very confusing at times so passive aggressive would look like oh yeah yeah i guess i could help you move um you didn't help me move when i was moving last but yeah i guess i could help you my back's been hurting a little bit but yeah yeah i could probably carry a couple of things um let me uh yeah i got time on saturday between like like one and two maybe maybe for about half an hour i could help you so I'm saying yes, but my message is no. And basically I want them to tell me like, oh no, it's fine. So that's, passive aggressive is very sticky and confusing. Passive is simply, you're okay, I'm not okay. So I don't wanna help you move, but this is how I passively respond. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I, I can help you do that. Basically just saying yes, even though you don't want to. And assertive sounds like this, thank you for inviting me. And I know this is a big time in your life, you're moving. So we acknowledge the other person. So it's this idea that I'm okay and you're okay. And it's this idea of you, me, and we in assertive communication. And this is the step to assertive communication. So, sorry, I interrupted myself there because I wanted to bring you to this slide. So acknowledging the other person's experience, request, opinion. So here's a big time in your life, you're moving, you would like my help. Absolutely. What's happening for me right now, I, you know what, I don't have a lot of energy and extra time to give right now. And I feel badly saying no, but I need to say no. And then we, so that's point number three there, sorry, those are supposed to be numbered. Um, we is, can I help in another way? Maybe I could drop off pizza at the house. And that's that joining piece that is so critical in assertive communication. And back to this model here, it's you, me, and we. Assertive communication includes them all. And Quite frankly, all of us at different times are gonna be engaging in one of these quadrants, depending upon our level of stress and how much we practice. But assertive communication is the way, folks, for lowering stress and increasing connection. So it's you, me, and we. So um, in our last little bit of time here, I actually want you to practice uh, responding assertively. So remembering that the steps to assertive communication are quite simply, acknowledging the other person's experience, so where they're at, acknowledge what's happening for you, I feel, and then suggesting possible solution, alternative ideas, the connecting point. So here's two scenarios that I want you to practice, maybe, maybe writing it out 
of how to respond in you, me, we. So imagine this situation, and perhaps some of you have been in this situation. A loved one's concerned about your diagnosis and wants to help you. They share ideas about some research they have read about, and they have a diet they think you should go on. How could you respond to that assertively? And then this is one other example, so you get to choose one of these to respond to. You tell a close friend that you are scared about your diagnosis. And this could be a support person too. I think some of you might be support people, so that you're scared about your loved one. They tell you, you just need to be positive. I'm sure everything will be fine. How can you respond assertively to that? So remember, step number one is stop and take a breath. Notice what's happening. And proceed mindfully with your assertive communication model. So we're going to take a moment here to quietly write possible responses to one of these situations. The one situation is the person who says, I got a diet, you got to go on. And the other person's like, just be positive. And remembering to use stop and the steps. So we'll give you just a few minutes here to play around with this. And I believe Yeshua might even play some soft guitar music in the background. It's beautiful. Thank you, Yeshua, for providing us a bit of background thinking and music. I'm such a treat. So just noticing what you came up with in that time and then being mindful of time. So you might not have worked through it all, even if you can get to you and me, it's great. And assertive communication always includes we. Sometimes if the relationship doesn't matter, we just do, yeah, I hear you have a diet. I'm not interested. <laughs> Case closed, boundary set, no. And if we care about the person, we talk about a couple of different ways that we may stay connected with them. So if we were in person, I would love to hear from all of you um, if, and what your ideas are, but I'm just gonna kind of give you some answers and see, and just compare and contrast your answers against mine. And there's no real right way in this, just in noticing if you have the tone of you, me, we. So in the first situation, acknowledging the other person's experience and opinion, right? So describing the facts of the situation, with empathy for your listener. I hear you would like to help and have a diet idea for me. So that's for that person who's got the diet, the research. So we just acknowledge them, reflect it back to them. I hear you have a, wanna help me. I hear you have a diet idea. 
And then the second one about just be positive. I appreciate that you value positivity and care about me. What this does in the you section is acknowledging the other person, it's compassion. And that helps us actually also, because it's really annoying, right? When people often give us advice. So some people have told me with this example about the diet and sometimes they're like, well, if they want to make the food for me, I'd be open to it. So, you know, there's boundaries, right? Some of us want that kind of help. So just so you know, um, but this awareness of, of maybe compassion of where these people are coming from, not that we have to take care of them or fix it, but it can actually just soften us as well of knowing that the intentions come from a place of wanting to help. So then we tap, check in, tap into what's happening for ourselves. Asking ourselves what stories might we be waking up? What thoughts and feelings are we having, having about this situation? I feel overwhelmed with the amount of information I'm receiving right now. So that friend who's been doing all the research about diets and stuff like that. I feel overwhelmed with the amount of information I'm receiving right now. So it lets them know where you're at. For the friend about positivity, when you tell me to feel positive, I feel stressed. I want to be positive and hope for the best, but, it's an intentional but, <laughs> but I cannot ignore my feelings. I feel scared. So it's letting people know, where does the worry come from? Where and, and how are we really feeling? I feel scared. I probably feel scared too, right? And then we go to the third step. So that's you, me, and we. And this is again, right? If the intention for healthy communication is connection, this we part is about building a bridge. And sometimes we miss this. People are like, well, I told you how I feel, but we forget to make requests and they're powerful. And sometimes we have to brainstorm together even, right? But that example about moving, I'll bring you pizza, as long as that's from our own personal place. So thinking about in these situations, what might be the bridge? So with the example of the diet, we could say, can I let you know in future if I'm interested in hearing about the research you've read? Or we can say, you know what, I really value our time together and I want to talk about other things besides my cancer, right? So those are two ways of setting a boundary and, and still saying, I care about you. I want to be in connection to you. And then with the positivity comment, can we find a way to be positive and also honor hard feelings, right? It's very normal to feel scared with a cancer diagnosis. I want and appreciate your support, right? So that awareness um, of authentic positivity, actually, it includes both the hard feelings and the positive feelings. Toxic positivity says, nope, we can't feel scared, mad, sad. Authentic positivity, you know, I want to be positive and I also feel scared. We can do both and it's a very mindfulness approach. So this is a planting of seeds of way that you can use assertive communications. And as a reminder, these are the steps. I think you know them now. And it's gonna be on the handout that we send you. And I'm gonna come to questions here, I've saved just a few minutes here. Um, and really the takeaway parts for me and what I'm hoping for all of you is really to be able to stop and take a breath knowing that each of us has our own authentic yes and no and that can change over time and change in different situations contexts and with people being kind to ourselves and others use our i statements and take personal responsibility and remembering the power of you me and we and this goes with our healthcare providers too i've presented this with oncologists as well and they say yeah this would be really helpful right with patients to healthcare providers if we can say i appreciate this about you like, I appreciate you're really busy right now. I'm feeling scared and need a bit more time. Can we please set aside a time to talk more about what this treatment looks like? You, me, we. And then I really invite you, because I'm sure maybe some things are percolating, you might want more support. Come and join us at Inspire Health. We have weekly workshops that are about increasing our awareness of communication. And in the month of December, we're actually dedicating uh, two weeks to healthy communication and it's a much more interactive workshop where you can come, engage, ask questions, and we really go slowly through different exercises around learning more about boundary setting and I statements and things like that. And then through the month of, um, like next month, we have a bunch of different workshops as well with the counseling team, and we have a lot of mindfulness and meditation classes as well. So come check out the um, website if you wanna learn more, um, and it would be wonderful to welcome some of you to our community if you aren't already connected to us.
and I just scooching this in. I know we have, I think, one minute left, but just wanting to see if there are any questions. Um, very open and willing to receive them. And Yeshua, I'll hand it over to you at this point to see if there's anything that you want to add or ask, or if there's any questions people might have, they can put them in the chat, I guess. Yeah, I um I haven't seen too too many questions. Um, there are so many, uh, just an overwhelming amount of comments about um, how helpful your presentation has been and how um, people just uh, flooding in with with love and support for our presenter Genevieve. And so, um, yeah, I don't have. Um, yeah, just they're they're still coming in. Powerful info, very thorough, very thoughtful. What a great session. Lots of valuable information to empower the patient. Uh, thank you, Genevieve. This is an excellent uh, communicator. Hmm. So, yeah, great just lots of uh, words. Yeah, just some great words of affirmation for our presenter, and uh, we're just so grateful for Genevieve for taking time to to be with us today um i we do want to respect your time i believe um i believe genevieve may have shared a a slide with her contact oh. information if not there is one yeah. with our contact information at ccsn where we can forward questions you may have to her or we can also point you in the direction of um, yeah. of inspire health but um, yeah, we'd like to thank you so much for attending our webinar today. Um, and again, just many thanks from CCSN to our presenter, Genevieve Stonebridge, for such an incredible presentation that, um, that I know many of our attendees enjoyed. This is one of many webinars we've facilitated in 2021, and all of our previous webinars are also available on demand at our website, survivornet.ca. Um, and we just in, invite you to stay tuned to your email and social media platforms for information regarding uh, some upcoming webinars we have as well. If you're not seeing our emails in your inbox, please check your spam or junk folders as we use a, a third party email service. And sometimes um, our emails can get uh, filled as spam or junk. And so we don't want you to be missing out. So please do check them out and mark us as safe. Uh, that way they'll come straight to your inbox. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Um, I realized um, I didn't put the handout in the, there, there's a hyperlink to the handout. Um, and yes, I think I just chatted it to you there. Did you get that? Um, I don't see it here. Oh yes, there it is. Um, I can put that into um, what I will do is I will put that link into the email that goes out tomorrow with the links for uh, the video and the slides. Perfect. And so everyone who uh, has attended and everyone who registered will receive a copy of this and that as well. Great, 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 great. Well, it's uh, such a privilege to have been here with all of you um, and really appreciate the invitation. and. The hope for all of you for mindful and healthy communication and just sending much kindness from my heart to all of you across the country, wherever you may be. Awesome. Thanks again, Genevieve. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs>